welcome everyone. Uh, it's the last session of the day and I have a lot to say. Uh, so I hope you will stay awake. So in order to do that, we'll keep the discussion going, especially because for those who, of you who were there yesterday, um, can I go on? <laughs> okay, for those of you who were there yesterday, th that slide deck was um, past research and this is kind of ongoing research. So at times I will have more open questions than I have results. Uh, and I hope we can use that as an opportunity to discuss some of the topics that I bring up. Um, so keep awake and help me out. Um, and just to kind of review what we did yesterday, we were asking the question of how do we get privacy engineering right? Um, and we said that there was a lot of privacy research coming out of computer science, um, but we, which you know, kind of assumes that all of this research can go into practice. But we wanted to ask the question, what can we learn from software engineering practice itself? both for privacy research, how it should be done, and how it can be applied. So the main statement we made is that how the sausage gets made matters. Um, and specifically, we said we wanted to look at three shifts in software engineering that happened in the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, one was from shrink wrap software, the software that you downloaded and installed and managed on your own computer, to services, from waterfall models to agile programming and from PC to the cloud. So today I'll explain what I mean by that um, in a little bit of detail, but again, to refresh in from yesterday, we talked about computer science research on privacy, and we said that there were three paradigms. I will not repeat those for those of you who were not here yesterday, uh, but later on we'll come back to them, and if somehow you have questions about it, just raise your hand. Uh, but I want you to kind of remember them as we go through what's happening in software engineering right now. Um, and specifically, we said that we would like to promote a new field or a discipline called privacy engineering, which would basically make it feasible to apply some of this privacy research informed by practice um, in the world. Okay. So um, the study on the shift in software engineering is an exploratory study. So what I'm going to present is rather new. Um, um, and in fact, it's better to call it work in progress. Uh, a lot of it is based on interviews and chats. Uh, most companies um, will not officially talk with me, so I've been taking developers out for dinners, um, and then they talk, which is really nice. Um, but <laughs> um, it's a little bit more official than that. I don't deceive them. I tell them that, I'm, that it is an interview, but there are kind of rules about what I mention and don't mention, um, depending on how they conduct the interview. Um, I also have been using for this work industry white papers. Um, I've been attending online courses on how to do software today, to how to develop it, how to engineer it. Um, and I've also been looking at legal and policy literature. Um, what I assume is not the case here is that you didn't spend the last 10 years, like myself, looking at what privacy folks have been doing, right? Uh, and I just want you to believe me that this shift has not been registered by everyone, and this is why this work is important. For some of you, what I'm going to show, you're going to be like, yeah, so what? We know this, right? Like, I've been developing software for 15, 20 years. There's nothing new here. But if you start thinking about the fact that policymakers may still be stuck in time, I'm not saying all of them, but many of them, and maybe some privacy researchers in computer science, that they think that we still have you know, software that you install on your software or uh, on your computer, uh, and that we use waterfall models, and maybe some of you do, um, then it will become clear that this, this shift makes a big difference. And the next one, next slide, is basically an age test. Who knows what this video is? Microsoft, correct? What is it? What is it? Of? <laughs> Which one? What? What? 98. 98 is too late? Earlier? 95. 95. That's right. This is the software release party of Windows 95. They lit up the Empire State Building, right? Like, this is a big deal. Um, so, you know, uh, as we discussed yesterday, it took about two or three years for any software release of this size to happen. Uh, it was a big party. The whole company would be turned around. Uh, and there was a big party. I'm sure these guys were, you know, sleeping for a few days after this party. Um, anyway, so um, basically, this is kind of a fundamental to the shift that I would say happened over the last 15 years. Uh, one could argue that it's a long time dream. Uh, I was talking with um, Jim Monaco yesterday, and he was saying that this is really like all the way from mainframes a dream um, that 
we basically make software engineering cheaper, more efficient, more successful. Um, and the way it is being done today, the shift that has happened is that we've moved to uh, software as a service, which is made up of these three components, which I'll talk about now. So let's start with the shrink wrap to services. Uh, for those who doesn't know what shrink wrap software is, because that's also an age test. Yes, do you have a question or do you? you do you, okay, so we discussed it shortly yesterday. So it used to be in the 90s when you had a computer, you would go to a shop, you would buy a box, right? And it had a plastic wrap around it. It had diskettes in the beginning. We were very proud of diskettes. I still have them at home. Then it was CD-ROMs. We thought that was a big advancement. And then you could download. But um, I'll talk about what the differences are. But interesting is where this came from. Um, and here is one turning point. Uh, who knows who this is? Is he on there? It's on there? No, it's not on there. It's Jeff Bezos, OK? Yes? Some of you recognize? All right. Um, I mean, you don't need to know who all these men are. There are a lot of them. We saw Bill Gates, Balmer, Bezos, right? OK, so this is a memo, apparently, that he sent in 2001, 2002. Um, First item, all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Now, none of this, I'm sitting on my database and I'll send you a dump, okay? Like there's an API and you can access it. Last item, if you don't do this, you will be fired. Okay, so this is, very <laughs> this is, this is a very sincere message, uh, at the least. Um, and it basically um, shows a vision that he has at the moment which is that instead of having you know, these silos, we should turn everything into services so that we can have cross-departmental and maybe cross-company use of um, resources, be it hardware or software. I don't know if that was his grand vision, but that's, a, that's what turned out to be, um, I would say, Amazon Cloud today. OK, so what do I mean by shrink wrap to services? Um, so if we identify shrink wrap software like Microsoft Word, um, I assume everybody has used Microsoft Word at some point. Yes, or maybe use open, uh, open documents, which is like also really good. Um, so basically, the idea is that the binary runs solely on the client side. So you install it on your own uh, hardware. Um, that means that there's a lot of overhead with respect to making sure that the software matches the hardware. Um, updates and maintenance are very cumbersome. You need to have local expertise. Um, and as you remember, software doesn't come out very quickly. So you know, it could be that the updates come in five to six months or longer. Um, users are in control. Um, that could be an oh no statement. Um, you pay in advance. So if you're a company that wants to buy software for your, all of your employees, you have to invest a couple million into licenses for Microsoft and then you have the software until the so software doesn't run on your hardware anymore. So, Services are, in a sense, on a continuum. So I put enterprise applications in there because enterprise might have in, in, installed services already internal to the organization. And apps, so the apps that you have on your phones, they still require you to download and install and maintain. So they're also somewhere in between. But let's say services in this talk are on the other end of the spectrum uh, that build on the server thin client model. Uh, again, I was talking with Jim yesterday, and he said there's a move back to thick client, but as I said, this is ongoing research. Um, that means that the data and the core code is secured by the service, so you never get a binary. So all of it is running on the server. Um, updates and maintenance then are easy because you do it all on the server side. Um, it's much more um, um, useful for collaborative applications. So if you're using Google Docs, you are no longer sending Microsoft Word attachments with the same title over and over again, not knowing which version you're looking at. I'm sure we've all had that problem as well. And it's pay as you use. So instead of selling products, these companies are now renting software, right? Like it's a very different business model. Um, and to be consistent with the company, I have Office 365, but you can also think of Google Docs or if you like a Pirate Pad or Etherpad, et cetera, um, then those are also kind of um, indicative of these kind of changes. Um, so what are, what are the implications of the shift to the services? Um, there's a, basically the, the transaction with the company now is no longer at the moment that you buy the software, but it's throughout use. And the reason that happens is if we look at this image, um, the production, let's say if you did Microsoft Word, right, like shrink wrap software production, you, you develop what Microsoft Word um, or Office, and then you have a release party, that's the red part, <laughs> right, like yay, it's out. Uh, it goes onto the shelves, people buy it, and then they use it. They're two separate time intervals, right? Like they're two separate things. 
Whereas with services, you are in a transaction with the company throughout um, your use. Um, this also means that development and the use of the technology has overlapped, which also means that it doesn't have to follow, but one of the things that happened is that use becomes part of development. Okay? Uh, and we'll talk about what that means. Okay, so what else happens? There's a big push for agility, not only in software development, but agility in companies. So what you have is that, remember Bezos said, make everything into an API. If you're going to develop a new service now, you focus on it, what it is that you're exactly offering, and then you take, you pull everything else from other companies or maybe other parts of your company, okay? Um, this means that there's agile service integration, so just within, with a few lines of scripting, you can include a service from another company and you can all pool data. Or if you're a company that is, for example, doing authentication, you can be integrated in hundreds or thousands of websites and you can pool the data from all of those websites into your service. Okay? What also happens as a result of this pooling and the, the rent model is that we have intensified tracking. So we often talk about tracking because of advertisement, but there's also a lot of tracking because of this bundled services and licensing, right? Because if I gave you Spotify, I want to be able to make sure that when you install it on your computer and your phone and any other device, that you don't have to pay multiple times. If you uninstall and reinstall again, and you had already paid for the, that, at least this is the argument of the industry, right? There's no intention to do this in a privacy preserving way. It's also very useful. You can sell the data later, et cetera. But let's just say that there's a push for intensified tracking as a result of this shift. Okay, so this is what services look like uh, today. So let's say uh, this is a picture album creation service. Uh, I don't have very <laughs> creative titles for these services. So you can imagine that, you know, there's, um, in addition to an, a nice um, feature that allows you to upload pictures and organize them, uh, you might have embedded media because you might, have, you might want to put video on your website that has your pictures. You might have some social functionality because you want to network with family and friends. Uh, you might have maps to show where the pictures were taken. You might have a payment scheme because you, I don't know, can send um, the pictures to, the developer, to a developer to be printed um, and advertisements. So all of these services may be pulled from third parties. What I found out when I interviewed developers is that when they develop this service, they also make use of services. Okay, so their production tools are maybe coming from some sort of platform as a service provider. Uh, they might be integrating libraries from data brokers and they might be integrating analytics to see who's using their service and how, uh, which then is used for doing user experience um, evaluations and A-B testing. Uh, they might introduce a third party again for the testing of their code integration, right? So not only are there many services in the front end, but also for the developers, there are a bunch of services that are being integrated. And you just have to imagine all of these are sucking data, right? For a privacy person, this is a nightmare, okay? All right, but I'll survive. All right, so <laughs> what do we have here? Um, this is one of my favorite, it's called Full Story. Uh, it basically gives you a complete video capture of your use of a web service. Uh, so this is used for user experience design. So if you get, you know, an email from one of your customers and they say, you know, yesterday at 3 p.m. Um, I used your service and I got stuck, um, then they can go and rewind back to that moment and replay the session. So they can see exactly what you typed, where, where you clicked, where you got stuck, uh, and help you, right? It's all about helping you. All right, so we looked um, with Dylan Reisman from Princeton University. We did a crawl of the web. Um, they have this wonderful web census project. And in the top one million sites, this is not the complete list, these were all the websites that included full story in there. So if you go to one of these websites, there's a good chance that your sessions are being recorded, right? Okay. I'm not sure if all of them, because that would be quite a bit of data, but at least that's the promise. Okay, so that's the first shift. The next shift is from the waterfall model to agile programming. Um, if you're interested in the history of software engineering, there's a book that I, I can recommend to you at the end of the session. I don't know the person's name right now, but he basically traces the battle between managers and developers since the so-called software crisis that was a meeting held by NATO in Belgium, I believe in the end of the 60s, okay? And for a long time, there, the discussion was, is engineering or software development a top-down thing where you have a goal and you break it into pieces and you give to developers and they're like machines and they just do their parts? Or is it something that requires real expertise? So you should really go bottom up, right? You should maybe have just one engineer and they should bring in their expertise and develop the software that way. 
waterfall model, I would say, is on the one hand representative more of the managerial perspective on software engineering, but it is also a relic of something else. Where is waterfall model coming from? Any, any ideas? Where is it still prominently used? They have to use it. Say it again. Construction. Construction, like buildings? Yeah. Something else related Military. to digital technology. Say it again. Military. Military, no. Closer to what we do. Hardware. Hardware. You have to plan hardware. You have to design it up front, right? You need big design up front for hardware. So I think you know, it would be very interesting to do a historical study of where waterfall model came from, uh, but I think this is one of the traces that you can find. Um, and for those of you who don't know the waterfall model, this is my waterfall. Um, here, dum, dum, dum. okay. Uh, so you start with uh, requirements analysis and specification. This is also where most software companies would contract, right? write a, a requirements document, which would literally almost serve as a contract for the software that needs to be developed. Um, from the requirements, you come to the specification, so you specify what the machine is supposed to do that is going to be developed. Then you move on to ar architectural design, and then you know around month six to eight, let's say, you're on implementation integration. Uh, hopefully in year two, you're at verification. It could be that you got stuck here for a long time. And at, at the end, hopefully there's a project um, which can be put into operation and maintained. Um, it turned out that um, 60%, oops, wait, sorry. 60% um, of software cost is maintenance, so it's at the end, right? And of that, 60% uh, is adding new functionality to legacy software, right? Um, and there were lots of studies in the 80s and 90s that showed that software that came out with this model, uh, I, can't have, I can't find the numbers exactly right now. Oh, sorry, um, but I want to say something like 70% of the projects failed, right? And failed was defined in a very generous manner. It, it could be anywhere from no software was delivered to the budget was doubled to the time was doubled, right? When software would be delivered. So around the 80s, these guys got together, okay? Uh, I find this picture very odd, but I'll... I'll <laughs> it, it, I don't know. Anyway, so there, you know, he, there's an enlightened man in the middle. This is on the website, and came up with what's called the Agile Manifesto. Okay, and they said we need to, uh, you know, stop this managerial stuff and focus on what we're doing, right? Um, and so we should really focus on individuals and their interactions. We should focus on getting working software rather than making, you know, big documents. Um, we should focus on customer collaboration. We should work with them very, very closely instead of going to them two years down the line. Um, and we should respond respond to change. There were many variations of this. Extreme programming was another one. Um, and it said, you know, just take it to the extreme. If you think short iterations are good, make them really, really short, right? If simplicity is good, do the simplest thing, right? This was also a mantra in open source software, free software. If testing is good, test all the time. If code reviews are good, review code continuously, okay? So this together with services, right? Now you have the code on your side and you can now do this agile stuff, right? You can constantly change the code. You can constantly test it. You can constantly talk with the customers, okay? So here's the implications of this shift. Uh, again, testing, testing, testing. And remember, we collapsed development and use. So you can now do user-centric development. Every time there's a feature that is somewhat usable, you can throw it at the users and see if they like it or not. Um, you can ask them, but that's expensive, so you can just watch them. Uh, so you can do data-centric development. You have very short iterations. That means that you focus on features and you do rapid feature development. Um, and you keep it very, very simple, right? This is how we come to the website that I was showing you with a picture album, where you make one little thing. You make it possible to upload pictures in a nice and neat way, and everything else you pull from elsewhere, okay? So what this uh, results in is feature inflation, right? Like all of a sudden, all of software, not all, but a lot of software engineering is about introducing and tracking features. Um, so I asked my interviewers, where do features come from, right? That's kind of an interesting question. And depending on if they were enterprise developers, so they were going to a company and selling software, or if they were end, end user uh, facing um, developers, they gave me different answers. Um, but it was kind of interesting you know, my boss said so, 
Uh, the other designer said so, my competitor did it, so this is kind of interesting to understand how new features come to the world. Um, and of course, like the product manager talked with the customer and we got the new features. Um, and then I asked, where do features go? And here we get all the analytics, right? So you make, it, you make a feature and you refine it based on analytics and you decide if you're going to keep it or not, again, based on analytics. So this is a very different way of software engineering than you know, the good old days, we have a requirement, we're gonna fulfill it and it's gonna be in the package and we're done. This is a very, very dynamic mode of developing software. Okay, so once you start putting analytics into your feature development and software engineering, basically, you're doing very data-centric development. So I started talking with people who do data analytics in companies. I said, what do you do with all this data? Um, so for data products, so people who are doing things like recommender systems or search or you know, anything that basically requires organizing and returning data, um, they said the mantra in our community is that we can't trust anecdotes. Right? If somebody says, you know, in, in Belgium, I, I search for the best university and I don't get KU Live and I think this is a problem, that's an anecdote. You don't trust that. So what you do is you do a test. You do, you do a test to see if there's a problem and you, you develop some metric, metrics to make sure that indeed there is a problem, right? This is a very important turn because you stop asking users what they want, but you look at the behavior of the systems and the users together, okay? But it was very interesting to find out that this data was not only used for software engineering, but because now they had services and a different rent model uh, to, to uh, manage, uh, which was important for their financial model, the same data would also go to, to calculate user churn. So how many users are you likely to have in one month, six months, et cetera, but also to do predictive modeling of pricing, okay? Um, all of this goes to show that data has become super central to the management and development of software. Um, here's an example from the analytics person. Um, so he would say, okay, let's say we have a new information panel and this is you know, a website that allows you to search for things and give you results and the new information panel gives you some extra information. We're just gonna test it. Um, and we find out that when we introduce it, um, the results are not very good, right? We have metrics, we test whether a new product is good and actually we see that the use, the use of this um, new feature is actually decreasing the number of interaction that we would like to see. Um, so they start thinking because they notice that the competitor has this feature too, and they know that if the competitor has it, it must be increasing numbers in one way or another, so they have a, a, a ground truth <laughs> based on the competitor. Um, and then he said, okay, then we would wonder if maybe our dashboard that analyzes to see if this feature is successful has the necessary um, let's a uh, metric to evaluate whether this feature is successful or not. And so one of the things that they would consider is mouse movement, because it turns out where you look uh, on your screen is often correlated with where your mouse is placed, or your cursor is placed. So they would start looking at cursor movements as a way to evaluate whether this feature was actually increasing the interaction in the way they would like to see it, right? And it turns out indeed it did. So they expanded their metrics, and this, this part is important later on, to include mouse movement so that they could identify where the users are looking at, right? To identify whether a feature is successful. So it, all in all, what does this mean? So the combination of these three shifts, right? Um, to services, um, the cloud, I'm not gonna talk too much about until later, and agile development means that we produce an almost recursive tracking system, right? First of all, you need to keep track of the users because you want to understand how your features are doing, right? And you have a lot of service components that you're integrating, right? You're bundling your services. So you need to make sure that they're all working very well every time you do a release. The reason I started this project was I spoke with a developer and, and he said that they had been doing 20 releases every week and I thought that was a lot and then I watched a Google video and they said they do about 50 a day uh, for one of the products and I was like, oh boy, okay. So if you're releasing code all the time and so are all the third parties that are integrated on your website, you need to make sure that they're all working together well, okay? So now not only do you track your users and your features, um, but you also have to track all your service components and you need to make sure to track the tracker that is tracking all the service components that it's really tracking everything, right? Um, how many of you have heard of Ghostry? 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 Um, Adblock? 
Ad block. Okay, so Ghostry is an add-on that you can use to block scripts, uh, right? Um, but if you look at the Ghostry website, you'll see that for end users like us, they say it's for privacy, so you can block um, scripts. But if you look at what they do for companies, they tell them how many third parties are integrated to their website, right? Because if I integrate third parties, it could be that they also integrate third parties. And at some point, I don't know who all is being served through my website. So you use Ghostry to find out who all is on your website, not the users, but services. Okay. Uh, so, any questions so far? Is this all known to you? I mean, sorry, yeah. You can also pay Ghostry not to be blocked. Um, That's right. As a website, so it's also uh, part of the business model. It's part of their business model, right? That's, 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 that's new, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I see you, Zach. Use Ghostry. I, I do Ghostry up. Use Ghostry, and then somebody pays some Ghostry to get on the whitelist. That's probably somewhere inside of my browser or in a service. You can see which ones are whitelisted. It's, it's, it's the same as the arms race between ad blockers and ad blocker blockers and ad blocker blocker and ad blocker stuff. Yeah. yeah, but they turned it into a market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? And, and just very quickly, was any of this news to you? I mean, did all of you know about this? Yes. Um, the agile um, cycle that you were describing doesn't seem to map very well with non-functional requirements and security and privacy. You don't steal my talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other comments? Any other thoughts? Is anybody working with this kind of environment, ecosystem? Yep. Yes. Okay. Do you guys ever do privacy and security? Yes. Yes. Okay. I want to talk to you afterwards. Good. All right. Um, all right. So if I've convinced you so far, and really this is a very limited study, right? It's a first impression based on a few interviews and some of the work that I told you earlier. That means that the user is in a transaction throughout use with a company that is including a bunch of services. So the user thinks it's interacting with one company, but it's potentially interacting with a dozen or more. Uh, and all of which are pr constantly tweaking and changing their features, right? And data protection says, when you go to a website, give, them, give the users a privacy policy and tell them what's going to happen. But there's a contradiction between this crazy world here and the idea that you could give consent to something that is going to radically change over time, okay? So this is, this is a huge challenge, okay? In many ways, okay. So, now we're going to ask, how are the shifts in software engineering, if we accept these shifts, and I'm sure there are other shifts as well, uh, and the ecosystem relevant to privacy research and practice? First, I'm going to go a little philosophical on you, uh, and I'm going to quote Philip Agri. He was a computer scientist. He was an uh, artificial intelligence person who then um, thought a lot about um, the social impact of technology. Um, and he was saying that there are two models of privacy. One is surveillance. And with surveillance, we, worried, we worry about people knowing things about us, right? But he says for developers, when we develop systems, what is more interesting is that we can capture how people behave. We can put it into a system as grammars of action. That's what he calls it, right? Like we can basically understand how a bank works, how a university works, or how trams get used, et cetera. We can understand all the little elements and we can put it into a st system and start optimizing it for economic interest. And he says, this is the problem that we have with privacy. So it's the fact that basically our everyday behaviors and our everyday institutions and our everyday environments are pulled down into little, gra little elements which can be put together by us so we feel free. But in fact, all of these grammars that are being given to us to basically speak our daily lives, right? Um, are being optimized for economic reasons, and that's the problem, okay? It's hard, I'm not gonna talk about this anymore, but I'm just gonna plug it in here, just to maybe have more discussion at beers afterwards, okay. Um, so, so yes? I remember this, ask a question. Sure, right yeah. Now because it, it would seem to me that if you are studying the aggregate of behavior that, that all the individuals have on the website, mm -hmm.
would be no privacy issue. That's right, but Phil Agri's problem would remain. That's why I put it there. Because Phil Agri is saying they don't, these companies, when they're interested in economic profit, and in order to do that, they want to be optimally integrated into our everyday lives and institutions and what have you, then who you are really doesn't matter. What's most important is that they can break it down to pieces that they can control well and market. It's a very different paradigm. So the, the model that you're talking about is still in the surveillance model. They know something about individuals. And I'm not saying that problem doesn't exist, right? We do a lot of privacy research that tries to address that problem. It is A, not clear if the only problem with what Agri is saying is privacy. It's much greater, I think. Uh, and that's something we need to talk about. But he says it doesn't matter who you are. Most important is that a system can be um, observed, turned into a system that can be evaluated, quantified, and turned into an economic good, through which you lose a lot of things, it, through, during which you may lose a lot of things. You don't always automatically have to lose things. You might lose due process. You might lose uh, control over your environment. You might lose um, decision-making power, et cetera, right? all these kind of things. It's difficult. I say it's a beer, beer topic, but I just had to plug it in because I, you know, I feel Agri is great. Um, I recommend that you read the paper. It's really fun. Um, and he has many other great papers as well. OK, so this is, I would say, the, the darker view over the shifts that have happened. Right? This is the privacy person's nightmare. It's not only that we lost privacy, but we also lose control over all our institutions and infrastructure and cities and what have you. Okay? This is what this is saying. Now, there are people who say, maybe we just need to think differently. So this is the other argument, which says, yes, we now have a different way of doing software engineering, but that means the, the shape of the problem has changed. But it's not like things are better or worse, but the shape is different, so we have to think differently. Um, this is not a privacy paper. Uh, this is a security paper based on code analysis um, by Sandy Clark, um, Michael Collis, M. Smith, and uh, Jonathan Smith, and Matt Blaze. Matt Blaze must be a name somewhat known to people in this room. So they looked at the code base of Firefox, which transi transitioned, let me see if I have the numbers, in 2011 uh, to a mixed model where they had rapid development, and then also extended support release. So the rapid development meant that they released code every six weeks, and the extended one, I think, was every six months. If I'm wrong on that, please correct me later. Um, and they noticed that with the rapid feature development that was happening, that you can't apply your usual security frameworks, right? You can't apply threat modeling. You can't do risk assessment. Code matur maturity is a joke, right? So they looked at the code base to see in rapid feature development, are there more vulnerabilities that are being encoded, and is the code immature? The answer was yes. But it turns out that there weren't necessarily more attacks. Right? And so their explanation for this in their paper is that there is what they call a honeymoon period where you release your code and the moment that an attacker has found a vulnerability. Okay? And by rapid releasing your code, you're extending the honeymoon. OK? Um, it's a funny term, honeymoon. OK. But th does, it, does it make sense? Did it go too fast? I can explain it again if, if it's an issue. Questions? So basically saying that, yes, it's fast. Yes, it's not secured. Yes, it's not doing all the things that we imagine secure coding to do. But it turns out, because of the acceleration of production, that the attack numbers don't increase. I don't think this is a reliable model, but I think it's an interesting paper to say, shift the way you think. Yes? Say it again? Also, also in Firefox. Firefox was maybe relatively new then, but now there's ancient code in there because it's older than a few years. So that immature code, yeah, will help attackers in, the, in London, I guess. You don't believe in their study? Is that what you're saying? I do believe in their study. Well, I studied very well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> After that honeymoon period, I think that you're all good. Right, right. Yeah. Any other opinions? So why would the honeymoon period be longer in this, this model? I mean, it seems kind of easy. I mean, the attacker still, I, the thing is that if I attacker's learning curve, I can imagine that. And because, you know, you release code multiple times and 
go change and maybe one medic found uh, vulnerability, it's maybe too late because the code already changed. Right, that's correct. So that I get, but I don't see why the honeymoon would be longer necessary. Uh, for the same reason? Or? For the same reason, those who are related, yeah. I recommend that you read the paper. I think it's a really fun paper. I, I like it because it really triggers you to think about things differently. Okay, I'm not sure if the if the message is to say, um, you know, <laughs> release new code every night regardless of what it does. I don't think that's the bottom line of this paper, but I think it's interesting. Okay, so now I want to take a little move back and think within this environment what happens to privacy research, right? Like I'm going to give you examples of privacy research coming out of the different paradigms that we talked about yesterday um, and talk about what are the challenges to these solutions and I think we can think about that together, right? Okay, so we have first privacy as confidentiality. Uh, this is the paradigm for those of you who weren't there yesterday that basically says uh, data should only flow to intended parties, um, otherwise not, and you should minimize data collection as much as possible. Uh, the guarantees you give with respect to privacy should be mathematically proven, uh, and you should avoid single points of failure. So no central entity should hold all of your data, and you should not depend on them to protect your data. So here's an example where this idea is implemented. So this was uh, called PreTP. Um, it was for a road tall system. And the authors say, you know, if you would do a road tall system in a very straightforward manner, what would you do? I can tell you what the authors say, but what is your imagination of how road tolling would be done? If you want to, ca if you want to calculate which roads people use and charge them based on the, on the use of the roads at a given time, how would you do it? You send out students with a tick marks. Tick marks on the crossroads. That's you what they do in the Netherlands. Okay, but you want to autom autom automatize. Oh, you want to, you want all yeah, the cars yeah, to be calculated. So yeah, that's, that's a lot of students. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. any other idea? What's the most straightforward implementation? Cameras. Say it again. Cameras. Cameras. Okay. Yeah. What else? I'll give you Pressures. link a uh, hint. It's uh, OBU onboard unit. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so you can basically do GPS tracking send all the data to the network all the time, so you track all the cars all the time, uh, and then at the end of the, uh, the month, you bill them and ask, and then the person who owns the car has to make a payment. Straightforward? Yes. What have we done? We're tracking everyone everywhere. Yes? Okay, if you're a privacy as confidentiality person, what would you like to do? Rip, rip up, opt out, rip out the thing and the data bit, or that's also a saving cost, of course. Okay. This tax evasion in this case. Okay. <laughs> Technically, what would you do? I mean, sabotage is an option, yeah. but what else would you do? <laughs> Go by bike. Go by bike, okay. Fake satellite system. Say it again. Fake satellite system. Fake satellite system, obfuscation, all right. Okay, well, our colleagues at Caleb and, um thought what they could do is use encryption. Okay. Imagine. All right, okay, so um, there is still an onboard unit. Um, the car and the, the onboard unit registers where uh, all the car was. Um, it calculates, it has a price model, it calculates how much the car driver has to pay and puts it uh, in what, in this little case, this beautiful picture, it's a cryptographic commitment, basically committing the user to all the paths that they have used and just adding in there the cost that they will have to pay, right? So the company, the tall service provider now just gets the final sum that the person has to pay. And if they're kind of dubious that maybe this car um, owner has been doing something else, maybe they tampered with their OBU, et cetera, um, then they can look at um, some, some of the, what, what they can do is, what do they call it? They, they do some random shots of um, different streets and then they can check to see if the shot that, in which the car appeared is in uh, one of these boxes, right? So you can use encryption. Um, it looks heavy, but they actually implemented it. Um, you can use this whole system to make sure that you never disclose a location unless there is doubt. And when there is doubt, the user of the car, uh, normally called the driver, can prove that he or she was at a certain point. Or if they cannot, then you, know, you can go through the legal case. All right? So this is a very typical privacy as confidentiality um, solution uh, where you still have the functionality that you want to have, but you minimize all sorts of things. So 
when I talked with colleagues and I said, okay, explain what you're doing so that we can tell software engineers how they can do this, they said, well, if you want to develop a system like this, you need to have three things. You need to have a very well-defined goal, goal. So you have a toll road, uh, you, and you just want to know how much people should pay. You d the, the requirement is not, I want to know where all the cars are at any given time. The requirement is, I want them to pay the right amount. And I want to be able to check that they pay the right amount. Right? That you surveil everyone in the process is the imagination of the software engineer. Right? And a privacy-preserving software engineer, according to this paradigm, looks at that well-defined goal and tries to minimize the data that is collected in a centralized, by a centralized entity or disclosed that is replicated across the system. So you have multiple copies and all the different entities for the billing. Um, you know, minimize centralize, centralization, minimize linkability, and minimize retention. So for people in this paradigm, if you are successful in your design, there is no personal data. So you don't have to bother with data protection. Okay? This is the advantage they say they offer uh, to companies. Okay. Here's another example. Um, this was a systematization of knowledge paper on secure messaging. So, so examples of secure messaging we gave yesterday, like Signal and WhatsApp. Um, and they also have a well-defined goal, which is that you should be able to send messages um, in a way that the privacy requirements, and in this case, the privacy requirements are not fu non-functional, but I would say they're functional requirements. So the, the messages themselves should be confidential. Somebody who gets your key should not be able to read all of your past messages, and they should not be able to read your future messages if they get a key. Um, you should be able to, at least in some cases, to deny that you sent a specific message or deny that you participated in a group. And if possible, you should be anonymous, okay? So they have very clear requirements that they want to fulfill, and there are dozens of different secure messaging uh, protocols out there that try to fulfill these requirements. Now, what was very interesting after the Snowden revelations is that this community that these, does these kinds of tools understood that they have an, a usability and adoption problem, okay? This was talked about before. I mean, there's a really famous um, paper called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt, which shows why something like PGP is just very, very difficult for you know, a normal human being. Um, and so what was really nice is that after the Snowden revelations, this community got a push, and a bunch of people from, from both industry and also the usability community joined them to think about how they could make um, secure messaging something that can be widely used, right? Not just for geeks. Um, so now they say we also have other quality requirements, which includes usability and adoption. The paper is really interesting. The list is much longer. I you know, really downsize them so that you, know, you don't get overwhelmed. Um, but basically they say we, every secure messaging system needs to have good mechanisms to, to establish trust, to secure the conversation, and anonymity. This is the transport privacy that they're talking about. Okay. The paper is beautiful. They, here's like the longer list of requirements that they, they're looking for. And here are all the protocols and all the implementations that they looked at to see if these requirements can be fulfilled. Okay. Now, very quick question. Remember what's happening with agile development. What is potentially a stress factor on these kind of tools if we think about what I talked about earlier? You don't need to look at this. You just this is too much to look at right now. <laughs> it's a lot of dots. So what we said is there's rapid development and new features. If you notice, well-defined goal, well-defined requirements, right? And if you have a moving software with all sorts of new features coming in, it's going to be very difficult to mathematically prove that after all of the new feature developments that your properties hold. That's a stress factor, right? And in fact, not for this reason, but for some other reason, I'll come back to this in a moment, um, the developer of Signal, uh, Moxie Marlin, uh, Marlin Spike, sorry, um, wrote this blog post, and he says, the ecosystem is moving. And if we go back just very quickly, we said one of the most important points of solutions coming out of the, this paradigm is avoid single point of failure. But I told you about services. What is the great advantage of services? The code is under your hand. It's most likely centralized, right? So now we have a very clear conflict of the ecosystem of software engineering going more and more towards centralization through services. 
And these guys saying, our main philosophy is that you should have things that are federated, right? Okay, so here we have Moxie stating it out loudly. He says, the ecosystem is moving, the platforms change out from under it, the networks evolve, security threats and countermeasures are in constant shift, and the collective user experience language rarely sits still. As more money, time, and focus has gone into the ecosystem, the faster the whole thing has begun to travel. I could have done fed signal in a federated way, there's nothing to stop it, but I no longer believe that it is possible to build a competitive federated messenger at all. Okay, very controversial statement if you're in this community. Um, but basically what he's saying is I need to be able to add new features. I need to be able to update. We all know legacy software and security is a disaster. I'm not going there, right? I don't think this is the only reason what he's saying, he's saying this, but in our case, this is what's important. Okay, any questions before I move on? Okay, I hope I convince you that this is a challenge for this community uh, that they'll be dealing with. Okay, then we have uh, people in privacy as control paradigm. These are researchers again uh, who, who are not necessarily thinking about the opacity of the individual, but much more about the transparency of the organization. So how do we make organizations that are collecting and processing our data transparent in a legally compliant way as well? Um, so the example I gave yesterday was with respect to privacy policies. Um, many of you have seen privacy policies. There are all sorts of jokes about, you know, reading them takes about, you know, if you would read all of them, it would take you 52 days of the year. I don't know. There are all sorts of uh, fun trivia. I don't have the exact numbers. Uh, and so here are some researchers looking to see if they can use um, the design borrowed from food labels to make um, basically privacy policies more readable to users or more easily to um, comprehend. But if we think about all the feature changes and all the third parties that are being integrated, it's actually more like a Christmas tree, right? Like it's constantly changing because we don't know. Um, I mean, because there's a new service that's integrated, there's a new feature, maybe there's a new pool of data. So that's not very good. Sorry. Oh, no. My Christmas tree. Okay. So I'm going to give an example that combines these two. So the third paradigm that we talked about was privacy as practice. And here we said that the researchers are very interested in um, giving users feedback, giving users good uh, collective information practices uh, so that they can also make good privacy decisions. Uh, so I'm going to go into the research that looks at privacy decisions because it's also related to the privacy policies example. Um, so I'm going to go into Android permissions. Okay, I put a little black stripe here because I'm going to test you. So when you're asked for uh, permission to use internet on your Android phone, what do you think it means? I'll go one by one and you can put your hands up if you believe it means what it is on there, okay? Send, send information to the application server. Do you think that's what it means? Nobody thinks that's what it does? One person, two, three, more? Some people are doubtful. You don't think that's what it means? You think that's what it means, but the gentleman behind you. So when you are asked for access to internet on your Android phone, what do you think it means? Does it mean that there will be information sent to the application server? Yes? Okay, so the second, it means that they can load advertisements. Who thinks that's the case? Is that what you would think? No, okay. Uh, none of these, uh, there are more things, options. Uh, they can read your text messages. Say it again. That should not be in this permission. Okay. <laughs> you know your Android permissions? Mmm, um, cheating. Okay, read your list of phone contacts. No. Okay, let's go to the next one. Read phone state. Read your phone number. Read phone state. Does that read your phone number? Mmm, not sure. Okay. See who you have called? Okay. One or two people. Track you across applications. One person. Two. Okay. I won't, um, you can look through the whole list and test yourself tonight. Here's the answers. So, indeed, internet means you can load advertisements. Read phone state means you can track you, that they can track you across applications. Okay. Across devices, I would say. Yeah, you can, I'm sure that this is not a complete list. Yes, question. Yeah, 
Uh, so basically, um, when you download applications, you don't necessarily um, register to them as the same person. You can re use your different email addresses, for example. But if they have your phone number, they know that it's the same user. Yeah? Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of semiotic amb ambiguity here. But anyways, this person, uh, Adrian Felt, Porter, who later went on to Google, was very interested in how Android permissions are perceived by users and how to do them in a decent and reasonable way, right? Uh, so she asked in one paper, for example, how do we ask for permission, right? If you remember what we talked about this new environment, you take consent at the very beginning, but things keep on changing. And regardless of that, you know, data may, that is very sensitive might be pulled the whole time. So maybe you don't just want to do install time warnings, but maybe you want to do runtime run consent dialogues, okay? So these are the questions that she was asking. And in a, in a previous paper, um, she found out that when she asked people if they even noticed that there was a permissions dialogue, 70% um, of the participants said they think they saw something um, on a survey, um, and 42% of the lab laboratory participants were unaware that there was even a permissions dialogue. Okay, this is no, not even whether it's runtime or at the very beginning. You know, when you in the say it again. It's in both cases the same amount of people. I mean, I would say that this is easy, more easily skipped than runtime permission. Right. So this but one, still I agree. Um, this paper was done, I believe, for the um, the one that I'm referring to is this one. Sorry. Right. And and I think the version of Android didn't yet have runtime permissions when she did that. But she's testing them out, right? Uh, she must be having loads of fun now that they do have that permission. Um, Overall, the participants of the studies demonstrated that they didn't understand how the permissions are related to privacy risks. Okay? So they, didn't, they were worried about privacy, they were worried about being tracked, or they were worried about their kids being tracked and all of this, but they could not relate, very much like us, what these permissions meant and what kind of privacy risks they may lead to. Okay? The problem is also that people just want to use the app, right? I mean, if they get the, the yeah. good thing about runtime permissions is that you can use the app anyway, and every time it wants to use a specific feature of the app, it would say, okay, watch out, now it's gonna use this, right. this data. And that's, I mean, if you just block the user at the beginning, the user would just say, nah, I want to use the app. Yeah. Just to so are you saying the runtime permissions are better? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, I wouldn't say it's a perfect solution. But, uh, right. That's right. It's called user habituation. If you get too many of those yeah, questions, then you just start accepting them. Yeah. <laughs> Say it again. I always press yes. I do it always press yes. I press no sometimes. Oh, yeah, so. I try to win and the app crashes and then, oh. So she does have in her study that a a majority of the internet survey respondents claims that they would not install an application because of the permissions. There's some hope, okay? <laughs> okay, but I think um, what she says at the end of this paper is that she says it's not really about whether it's during runtime uh, or, or you know, permissions asked at the, per at the beginning. She says what's really important is, is it intrusive to the users, okay? And in almost all of this research, especially coming from the US where they don't have the data protection requirements, they look at users' expectations. They don't necessarily look at what is legally required, which is very important to notice when you read papers, look to see where they're from, because those are very different things, right? So if I would tell a data protection officer, well, the users don't mind, they're like, no, that's not the way. There's a law, you have to apply the law, right? But the question is, what can the data protection officer tell you? What you should you be doing? Um, so here's another study that followed up. Uh, and said, so, okay, maybe we want to do runtime uh, permissions, um, but how do we do it um, so that we show them the permissions that would be counting as more sensitive um, and make sure that we don't, you know, the ones that would be defying users' expectations, is, it's again an American study, but that doesn't lead to user habituation. Like this is the question that they asked. So in order to be able to even answer that question, they first had to understand how many permissions are being asked for, right? Like in the back end or on your phone. So they did an experiment for one week. They gave out 36 Android smartphones 
And uh, so they looked at 6,000 hours of real world use and found that 27 million permissions were requested. Okay, that's a huge number. <laughs> okay. And it was very interesting because they, they have many assumptions about what would surprise the users. Um, they use um, Helen Nissenbaum's contextual integrity. If you didn't notice it, it was kind of hiding here. Um, Helen Nissenbaum, as we discussed yesterday, says that there's contextual integrity to spheres of life, right? There's some sorts of information flow we, thought we find are acceptable, for example, in the education setting, right? It's okay for you to ask me what I know, right? This isn't a setting. But you know, if you're my doctor and you ask me about what I know in my academic life, it's kind of awkward. So there are these information flows that are informed by the social context. But in this research, people say a permission is out of context when it is being asked, for example, when you're not using the app, when, that, when your phone is in your pocket, in which case it's out of context and maybe you should be asking the user for permission. Right? So they have a different understanding of context even though they use Hellenism out theory. Okay. Um, yes? So, sorry, I didn't quite get the 27 million permissions in that? Yeah, in one week, 36 phones. So that means on average about 100 permissions per, per user? Yeah, that's, that's about right, yes. That's it. I mean, that doesn't seem plausible. You can't, yeah. you can't possibly be content with 1 million requests. That is correct. We'll be coming to that. That's right. I don't think they, I'm not sure if they have the websites. I should check though. Yeah. So I, we'll come back to these numbers and why they're kind of crazy. But remember a moment ago we were thinking we should maybe do on-the-go permissions, we were saying privacy policies are long to read, permissions ahead of time are not reliable, but now we're seeing that so many permissions are being taken, which I think is a big problem, which I think is a problem maybe we should also be t talking about, that notifying and making them transparent to the user becomes a challenge in itself. I think it's super relevant now because with the new European law, the GDPR, we're going to have to ask people for consent for every data process, so every website is going to ask them for permission, and I mean, we saw the same thing with the cookies, people just click it away, and that's just one legal ground, you have other legal grounds where you can, uh, for instance, if you're fulfilling a contract, you don't need permission to do so. No, no, I mean, sure, but if we're talking about websites, yeah. and you're storing data, you link it to an IP, you have to have that consent. I mean, the question is if everyone can do that, that's not the, I mean, legally speaking, you're gonna have to do that, and it's going to be, it's going to be top ups on all websites, right? And, or it is already. <laughs> it is already with cookies, and no one cares. Everyone just clicks it away. I mean, it's a. I mean. This, I mean, it's kind of interesting to look at the results of the user study in that sense, right? And here, I think there is a value in this kind of user expectation studies, even though they don't look at the legal requirements, right? And the users that they spoke with said they would at least block one permission, I mean out of 27 million, uh, that's not a lot, but they said that 35% of all the requests were deemed inappropriate, right? So I think there are two problems here. One is there's too many permissions being taken and granted to app developers, right? I don't think these papers address that problem. These papers only address the problem, how do I communicate this to the user? I think what I hear from the discussion is that we all see this is not something that should be posed to the user as you know, a way to protect themselves or something. This is way too much because already so many permissions are being taken that it's kind of ridiculous to say if we just give them consent, we empower the users, right? We're, I think that's the discussion that partially we're having here. Again, this is a great topic for beer later or whatever you drink. Um, but I think um, what's interesting about this paper um, is that doing privacy engineering is not just about data flows, it is also about data flows, but it is also about answering these kinds of difficult questions. And this is all I want to convince you of. We cannot solve all the mistakes of data protection or limitations, uh, but I think 
This shows that we have an ecosystem that is really accelerated using way too many permissions, so we have to deal with that. And if we want to empower users according to data protection by asking them for permissions, then we need to look into this kind of scientific work. So these are two different things that need to be done. This paper addresses only the second point. Okay. So coming back to the question of what can a data protection officer not tell you, not tell you right? what they can tell you is that you should be asking for permissions. Right? What they cannot tell you is when should you be asking for the permissions. They cannot tell you how you should be asking for the permissions. They cannot, ask, they cannot guide you in ways to design the whole infrastructure or your app so that you don't have to do this. These are all the things that we need to do if we want to take privacy engineering seriously. Okay, so this is where uh, the science itself or the engineering practice is very, very important. Right. So, but what about the cloud? Um, I don't have too much on the cloud. I wish I had more. Um, that will be hopefully next year. Um, here's a paper that talks about ensuring privacy in the clouds. Um, it's again by American authors, so uh, they leave out GDPR or uh, European Data Protection Law. Um, and they say one of the biggest problems with the clouds is we're not sure who's going to be responsible, right? Um, that means that there's a lack of transparency to those services using the cloud as to how the cloud is structured. So they don't know if they took the necessary security measures, if they're going to make sure you're not co-located in a kind of a sensitive environment, um, how they're going to be accountable with the data that you put on the cloud. <laughs> And, and for the cloud providers, it's unclear exactly what they'll be responsible for. So all of this needs to be kind of figured out. Um, they also say that there's a lack of trust, again, in both directions. And there are regulatory challenges. Because depending on where your data is going, because of the cloud service provider that you use, um, you might all of a sudden find your data in the US, which means that certain laws apply and other laws don't. Um, and both can be a problem, right? If too many laws apply, then you have to deal with being compliant to too many laws. If no laws uh, apply, then it could be that the intelligence agencies are having a lot of fun with your data. Okay? Um, so one way to deal with this is uh, service level agreements. Um, and so the paper goes on about what kind of things should be in these agreements. Um, I'm curious to hear what kind of engineering elements should be in there. I didn't find many papers who thought about like privacy, engineering, and the clouds. Um, but if you have some ideas of what could be done in this environment, I'd be very happy to hear. But this is, I think, part of the problem. Um, and I do think that the geographically where your data is, especially after, again, the Snowden revelation has become very important because depending on where your data is, it, it determines who can grab your data or ask for it, legally speaking, or eavesdrop on it. Okay. Um, so how are the ships in software engineering and the ecosystem relevant to privacy engineering practice? So from here on, I'm going to be very speculative. So please help me if you think I'm not right. Um, I think that a lot of the data protection laws that we have are very data centric, right? So um, yesterday I was giving you the example of all the brochures that came out of the privacy conference in, in January in Brussels called CPDP. And all of these companies that were basically doing data protection as a service were doing data management. And I argued at the beginning of my talk yesterday that privacy is not just data management. It's not about just keeping a list of what data you've collected in case somebody you know, knocks on your door. I hope you're now convinced of that. But I also don't want to fault those companies totally because I do think that the data protection and a lot of the privacy theories are focused on flows of data. So they don't say much about how we should engineer systems. They think about flows of data. Right? They do say minimize data, but they don't exactly um, guide people in how to do that. And by now, because of the ecosystem that we talked about, right, because of the move to agile and services, this data lifecycle is not just internal to a company, but it's across companies. And some researchers have, um, have picked up on this. So here is Eddie again. It was mentioned yesterday uh, from Travis Burrow at his group in Carnegie Mellon University. Um, it recognizes that privacy needs to be managed also between platforms and apps or across services. Um, so he looks at the privacy and data supply chain, okay? So, and one of the ways he does that, and, and we can discuss what are the strengths and, and, and weaknesses of that approach, is to look at the privacy policies, to code them into a formal language in order to identify conflicts in an automated fashion, okay? So basically here we have multiple privacy policies from Facebook, 
from Zynga, who, who runs apps, or they call them plugins, and AOL. And, and they, they formalize this using um, description logic. So they talk about obligations and permissions and prohibitions. And once they have basically encoded the legalese in this formal language, they can now, in an automated manner, check to see if there are conflicts between Facebook and Zynga, for example. Yeah? Uh, if you have a lot of data, like Facebook, this is a very useful tool. OK, so here's a part of their results. So it turns out the Facebook API has more prohibitions, and Zynga takes a lot of data. OK, so <laughs> that's a conflict that they identify. Um, what are some advantages and disadvantages of this kind of approach? Do you have any ideas? I'll put this. Thoughts? I think the original policy doesn't necessarily correspond to the actual situation. That's correct. <laughs> if we continue in that logic, what else could be a problem? And ambiguity, so maybe yeah, stuff can be ambiguous, maybe. That's correct. And, and this, this is, yeah, nice and strict and formal. Right. In fact, the same group with a different set of authors did a study and they used um, uh, you know, mechanical Turk workers and experts to, uh, to interpret sentences in privacy policies. And even the experts couldn't agree always on what the sentence said, right? Like, so, um, and, and there's a lot of critique of privacy policies that not only are they leg legalese, but they're deliberately left ambiguous to lead, allow the company to get away with things, uh, which means that they're not actually fulfilling the role, which is to be transparent to their users. Um, but then it becomes very dubious to use them as the, as the starting point of doing any sort of privacy analysis. Yeah? Yes? I think you know you work on, I mean, even if you, if you allow for the fact that you, maybe you can describe it formally, but you can actually verify that you can at least at least the cases. So there is a paper by Anupam Datta and his colleagues that they're working together with um, Microsoft. And I think they're applying something similar uh, in the, with the Bing data. Uh, and I think because it's internal to the company and the company agrees to do it, um, it's not based on privacy policies, but it's basically, they're not doing the step from the policies to the formal language, but they're basically encoding the rules in a formal language and then following the app developers. Um, I think they are doing verification, um, that there's an engine that basically does that. Of course, there's always a difficulty with policy languages that there might be difficult things to compute, but that's, I think, the point where you get alerts and you have to look to see if the conflict is a real one or if it's just, you know, but weirdly stated things. If that's been done internally, that, that's good. Then the company can, can know that they actually deliver what they promise. Mm -hmm. says that they do what they promise is the same as the, as the one that they promise. So you, you really need a third party. That, that checks. That's what you mean with verification, not in terms of, OK. Um, so I agree. Um, and I think we run into a lot of problems with the secrecy that these companies often work under. Um, having said that, I think. I'll be careful with how I say this, but I think there are companies who want, who want to be examples, right, in one way or another. And I think they, I think Oracle tries to do this, for example, and, and Microsoft tries to do this. I'm not going to say that they're amazing with respect to privacy, but they do try to set examples, set a tone for a variety of reasons, um, meaning that they apply these things and verify internally. If we would be happy with what they think is privacy, I'm not sure because I don't know. And I think your, your question is very valid there. Um, but I can imagine that they're more diligent than other companies. No. I don't know, though. So, OK. So the point I wanted to make here is that in most companies, and please correct me if, if in your situation it's different, the part of the software engineering team that looks at the data flows or manages the data is a different one that th than the one that does engineering. I mean, in small companies, that's going to be different. But there's going to be a part 
who's managing all the data, the incoming data, make sure that the storage is there and it's efficiently um, you know, accessible and that it's secure and what have you. But then there are those who are developing the features, right? They're going through development steps. So this is the software development lifecycle. So what we need is something that helps the engineers when they're developing systems to identify with, with these, these privacy requirements, both with respect to compliance, but also applying some of the stuff that's coming out of research in everyday development practices, okay? So one example here is Linden, uh, and we have the author here in the very back, Kim. <laughs> So Linden tries to make the connection between the data lifecycle and the engineering steps by basically bringing the data into a threat modeling moment. I don't know if that's an appropriate description. Maybe I should give you the, the floor. But basically, Linden provides um, a, a threat modeling system that is very similar to security threat modeling. Uh, so it's kind of intuitive. And it looks at data flows and what kind of threats may, um, may be relevant and then looks for ways to find mitigation strategies. So here are the first three steps. So you uh, model the data flows. This is a very, very simple example that I found in the tutorial. And then you look to see if any of these threats, which you know, come together to Linden, may apply to these data flows in these cases. And then for each of the threats, you develop a threat tree. And then once you know which threats you want to pri prioritize and address, you can look for some of the mitigation strategies which are in the repository. So which threats is Linden looking at? Here it is spelled out. Um, you know, can you link to uh, items of interest um, that shouldn't be linkable? Uh, can you identify the users or a subject in this case? Um, or the other way around, a subject, a user in this case. Um, is non-repudiation a possibility? Non-repudiation was something we also saw in secure messaging that you can deny that you sent a message uh, or you t took a certain action. Um, can you uh, detect that a certain IOI exists? Um, are, are there maybe threats due to disclosure of information, unawareness of the users, and non-compliance with law? Okay. So this is very useful, I find, in the sense that it tries to make that step between data flows and engineering activities. Um, another paper that looks at these things are Privacy Design Str Strategies by Yapeng Hoopman. Um, this somehow is a wink at privacy design uh, patterns, which is also going around, but there are lots of different ones. But basically, um, I think what Yap Hank Hoopman is doing, he's more from a privacy as confidentiality uh, type of background, is looking at design patterns or strategies that inform a lot of the solutions that come out of privacy as confidentiality, right? And to remind you, privacy as confidentiality is the one who did the road tolling system, minimize the data, use encryption, uh, and so what he has here is, as I said, minimize the data, separate the databases, so federation, we were talking about that earlier. Aggregation, this is when you start using things like k-anonymity or differential privacy, which basically makes it impossible to identify individuals. That was your question, Johan, earlier. Um, hiding data, again, this is related to encryption or zero-knowledge proofs. Um, demonstrating, so verification, demonstrating to third parties that you have done well. Um, enforcement of the rules that you've set and with respect to the data subject, informing them about what's going on in the system and providing them with controls. So this is really great, and I think we need more of this kind of research that takes the steps to make privacy research accessible to people who are developing software. But the problem, yes, yes? Yes, okay, good. Um, but the problem is, this is what, if we go back here, this is the Microsoft Secure Software Development Lifecycle it still looks like waterfall, right? It still has requirements, design, implementation, all of those things are still in there. But we just talked about all these teams going agile. So when you look at the agile development, there is no more word of sometimes requirements. This one has requirements. Yeah, so user stories or requirements. There were so many pictures. I, didn't, I took the colorful ones. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, this one is very interesting. It doesn't talk at all about data. There is no data, right? And it's very interesting because actually one of the things we could write a paper about is what happened to the file with services and agile development, okay? In Google Docs, you still have files, but in most other applications, you don't have files anymore. 
it's very annoying. You can't find them, right? Apps are like this interface and you have some information, but they're not organized in files. The file has disappeared, right? So the data is, is a misleading concept because if you give your data, you're not just giving your attributes, you're giving metadata all the time. Most people don't think about their metadata, but that's how all that quality assurance and tracking and meta tracking is being done. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to either put that into the data life uh, cycle because data life cycle looks at your attributes. It doesn't necessarily put metadata there. I don't know if that's the case, please let me know. But you don't even concern yourself with data anymore. You're just building features. That's the logic. But isn't that, I mean, data doesn't play a role in here. I mean, the feature could be, in, data could be involved in the feature. But yes. It isn't involved in the life cycle itself, right? That's right. I mean, I don't see why data should be part of the life cycle. Uh, for I mean, privacy, it needs to be somewhere, right? Because a lot of data isn't necessarily involved in the waterfall model either. I mean, uh, where would you put uh, data in the waterfall model? Maybe also in requirements or something like that, right? That's right. But, but you add it there. So you also have to add it here. So you add it to the features, right? Yes, to the exception criteria or to the, to the, mm -hmm. for example, to the user story. There. To the user story, OK. You, you might have a privacy policy over there. Right. I don't know. I'm asking. I mean, really, this, these are the pictures I'm looking at. And I'm really wondering, when software development goes agile, where do we put threat modeling? Where does it go? I heard there was a talk on agile threat modeling. I'm very curious about how it went. What I really like about this image, though, is that it has retirement, right? That's when a feature retires. It goes to a sunny beach and serves some cocktails. Um, basically, here, they do mention data. So I gave you a, a bit of a trick. Here, and they talk about an um, enterprise model, but I'm not sure where that model is ever introduced, updated, maintained. It's not here, okay? And, and I'm very curious to continue talking with developers to see if they have time for taking care of what data that they're, they're pooling in. Um, I mean, the developers that I spoke with, for example, would say, oh, right, I integrated this analytical company, but they were not so good, but I forgot to unplug them, so they're still getting my user data, right? Like, so I had these kind of comments, but I never heard of them really thinking about not only what data they're collecting, but how they could maybe, with respect to the data that they now collected and others have collected, linkability is possible. So all of the threats that, for example, Linden talks about, it's not clear how you would think about it, not just with respect to your feature, but in combination of all the features and services that are out there. So I'm very curious to see where it goes, and all recommendations are welcome. OK. Um, here's another one that I really liked. Um, so this was, again, for if all goes well with security development. Um, I believe this refers to the security defects decreasing. Like this is the hopeful line, of course, right? Um, but what's interesting about privacy not with respect to the back end, but with respect to the user. So all the social stuff and all the kind of permissions and asking them and all of this. When you introduce your software into the world, most of the times that's when you find out if there's a privacy issue and how you should be dealing with it. So the line might be actually kind of here and it might kind of look like it's going down and then you go into production and you send it out into the world and you have all sorts of privacy problems. So we need to think about these things differently. Uh, we need to make sure that developers are not scared of this. We need to think about how we can give them the skills to reach out to the research community and take some of the tools they've been developing. Um, but th I think these are hard questions ahead of us. So this talk and yesterday was about the impact of agile software engineering practices on computer science research in privacy and how it should go in the future. Here's my outlook and, and maybe we can take a little bit more time to think about what else could be in the outlook. Um, my argument is that privacy research needs to speak much more with software engineering practices. Um, it needs to understand how they work. Um, and so in order to do that, I see some future research possibilities in evaluating some of the mental models that privacy researchers have and maybe correcting them with respect to how practice is today. Um, look at concepts like feature inflation or practices like feature infl inflation and how it may impact um, positively or negatively, uh, the use of privacy and security techniques and tools. Um, we need to better understand the role of behavioral analytics in software engineering. Is it really useful? Do we really need all this data? Is there another way of doing it? 
Um, if we're going to do it with behavioral analytics, can we do it in a privacy preserving way? Would that solve the problem? Or as Phil Agri would say, no, that wouldn't solve the problem. Um, and what's also interesting is that, um, remember I was talking about metrics to measure whether you're succeeding or not, and the dashboards that, um, for example, data analytics people will use. They said that for services, we're only in the process of developing these metrics, right? So we don't know yet exactly when we've done a good job in capturing people's behavior. So that might be an interesting opportunity uh, to develop both privacy metrics, but also think about privacy preservation in the making of metrics. Um, there's some hope with it respect to data protection. I think data protection did not foresee or expect all of that is happening right now with uh, agile development and services. But the good thing is that data protection was originally developed for mainframes. So maybe we need to read them in a different way to see if there's maybe more protection in them in this environment than we think so. Okay, that's it. Discussion? Shall we have some discussion or shall we stop? Are you guys tired? How are you doing? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, uh, I mean, this is great work. I mean, there's the same problem in, if you're using security and privacy, I mean, it's exactly the same problems. The, the thing is that, as you mentioned, software development got changed a lot in recent years. But security and privacy keep on jumping behind or kind of trying to catch up. Yep. And, and I mean, I, th I think, I mean, I don't have a solution. I wish I had one. But, mm -hmm. uh, um, but I think for both cases, for both security and privacy, there could be similar similar solution. I mean, mm -hmm. to embed that in the software development lifecycle. We had earlier this week with Bart uh, Dillon also uh, he also discussed this from the security development lifecycle point mm -hmm. of view. Mm -hmm. that, that, that research also happened a lot on the waterfall system instead of the, I mean, and they're also trying to evolve it to the, the mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think both kind of research could complement each other. We should join forces is what you're saying. I like that. No, it's good. I think it's really good. I mean, I think there are certain kinds of privacy problems that can be better dealt with and others not so. Um, I think that by virtue of being able to update code, if you make a mistake, you can correct, right? Like, so that's really good for especially the user-facing stuff, right? Like, you thought you did a good job with asking with per permissions, but it turns out it's a disaster. Then, you know, you can, you can take it back and update or improve and, and what have you. Um, I think it's less with, you know, privacy is confidentiality. Uh, applications where if you make a mistake, then then you have lost the data that you want to protect, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, sure. But the thing, the, the, I, I think it's a good approach anyway to at least be open for the new kind of way that people develop. I mean, a lot of security people say like, oh, this is this is a disaster, agile, agile development. I mean, sure, from how we did, how we used to do security, this is it's kind of a disaster, but let's not make a problem of it. Let's right. look how we can change how we do security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also the, the, the societal outlook on, on what we mean with privacy. I mean, in, in 20 years or 25 years ago, there wasn't a computer to, to register when I put a track on my CD, right, CD player, right? And nowadays, it's we don't <laughs> care that Spotify knows at what time I, I, I am putting on what kind of music. And when at the, the first streaming or or even uh, what's the process called that you that an application listens to what you're playing and then and then saying what you're playing because you maybe don't know or so that hmm? uh, yeah scrolling or so so it was called in it back in the days that that it scared me because uh, why would, why should that know that I'm now playing Pink Floyd. It's not relevant to nobody. And nowadays, with, with Spotify, we don't care that they that they know at the exact second I put on a record. Yeah, I don't use mm -hmm. Spotify, but yeah. But anyway, I use other streaming. Uh, I had a few a few comments on, on Facebook. People were quite surprised that Spotify was posting what they were listening to. <laughs> without even, yeah, right. they had no clue. Um, obviously, it's not visible to them because I I think the algorithm of Facebook right. needs it. Mm -hmm. So, but it is posted to their contacts, and, and it was a shock when I pointed it out. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, you point out by chat or so, oh, there's a picture, I'm going to sing that. Yeah. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> that right. awesome. that, yeah, that's the other way. It's, it's awareness that, that everything you do is being broadcast. Yeah, I mean, I think those are like classical cases where privacy uh, engineering could have helped, right? Like if you could kind of notify well that Facebook would now, um, you know, broadcast to the world all of your teenage favorite songs or whatever, and uh, it's, it's embarrassing. Um, but, you know, it's not only, I mean, I can imagine overkill privacy engineering in Spotify, right? Like I can make sure that the recommendations do not reveal anything about other users. I can make sure that they can get information about your stream without really knowing who you are or what you're listening to, uh, whatever. Like we can just go in all directions. Um, but I think, of course, what happens with a lot of privacy examples is that we think about Facebook and Spotify and things we do to entertain ourselves, but we don't think about everyday infrastructures and everyday institutions, right? So when the university starts you know, has, having an algorithm that recommends what degree you should take because of your past performance, um, then of course things become dodgy, right? Like, or, or when something is at stake where your life chances are determined, then I think that privacy question comes up much more clearly. Uh, I mean, I have this also with friends who are doing machine learning. You know, often if you go to a machine learning lecture, they'll start talking about fish and stripes and how you can distinguish the fish with two stripes with, versus a fish with three stripes. It's the most apolitical example that you can give, and it's kind of cute, right? Like, I can distinguish the fish. Um, but if I start saying, okay, um, I'm going to decide who is worthy of employment and not, then we have a discussion, right? And so I think, um, you know, Spotify may not look like uh, it's so relevant, um, or it's not so important, or actually we're kind of happy that it recommends very good songs or what have you, um, but we can imagine that as services go into everyday infrastructures that we use at work or with our families and, and you know, in our hospitals and uh, government systems, elections, right? Like, then, then we start having other worries. And so the point of privacy engineering is to make sure that we have something to address those worries. Yep. So I, I think the, the big difference, sorry. So we have, let me take Johan and then we'll come back, okay? So let's take the need for privacy engineering as it is. But what I don't quite understand why you seem to think that it's impossible or even more difficult in, in an agile environment than in a workflow environment. I mean, I'm sure uh, it's not being done. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm trying to say is that the de facto mental model of most computer scientists doing privacy research is closer to shrink wrap software and waterfall model than services, right? And, and I say if we make that shift, then there are new challenges and stresses on some of the privacy solutions that they're, they're proposing, right? So the, if... The, the fact that services are being used is actually... Right. So I agree with you, but I think I personally see those three things pooling on each other, right? I don't see, um, I mean, if there are companies doing services and waterfall, I'm very interesting, interested in talking with them. But what I hear is that things get mixed up. Some people do waterfall and agile, but there's great pressure to go in this agile direction. And there's also great pressure to go onto what is called the public cloud, even though it's all privately owned. Um, so I, I think that I don't see these things. I agree with you that the only problem is not agile development, right? If we had a waterfall, um, you would still have issues. But the point is, if my colleagues at privacy, in, in the privacy research and privacy is confidentiality say, I need to fix the functionality. Right? Like, I need to do that so I can design a crypto protocol that does only what it's intended to do. Right? And then it doesn't matter if it's waterfall or agile. If you constantly want to introduce new features, which waterfall is less likely to do, in my opinion, than agile. Not necessarily. We can talk. I think, th I think that's where 
there is an advantage to them when things are a little bit more set in the beginning. So quicker. As yeah. Little yeah. Okay. Even if they came up with new features all the time? I'm not sure. Yeah, because the, because yeah, the reason yeah, they could... still have a set of principles around, uh, around the entire project. It's not, it's not that the entire project constantly changes. You, typically, you have, uh, you have a general, some general principles, and you have some set uh, acceptance criteria where you should, that, uh, or in the definition or in the definition of donor, when do we consider this, fe this feature done? And one of the things you need to be to have checked before you can call your work done is do I still adhere to that and then that standard that we set for mm -hmm. say privacy okay. or, or, or similar uh, uh, things. So it's, it's still, I think it's possible. So maybe it's an interesting question to see what kind of techniques started getting applied with Agile, for example, in the case of testing, because I think testing became very, very central to Agile. I don't know if this is the case, like if we can say this generally with respect to waterfall. Uh, but be, one could, so to say, hook into that testing environment as a way to develop privacy as confidentiality solutions. Is that kind of, okay. That's a very interesting I, question. I agree with, I mean, I think that's, you have a double, I mean, you have two things, right? You have one thing is, okay, in, the, in one feature, in one story or whatever, there is, is there something, let's say, data involved, okay, do I, do I need to adhere to some kind of practices? So privacy mm -hmm. practices, which is great. And then you have what you say, like privacy as confidential, confidentiality. It would be um, a little bit more, that would be kind of a feature, right? I mean, a feature could be, I want my data encrypted, and then the encryption would be a feature. And so yeah. it, it doesn't really contradict the, the agile, uh, Way of mm -hmm. I mean, I think the reason I want to ask this question more deeply is because, again, talking about certain paradigms. So I think um, one of my answers to you, Johan, is that depending on the paradigm, there are different advantages and disadvantages of this shift, right? And I think that for a lot of the user experience kind of stuff, the shift is actually not so bad. I don't know. I don't. All of this is a question mark and, and things to be researched. 
But I think by virtue of being able to release quickly and do testing and what have you, uh, ideally you should be able to plan for user experience better. Now with confidentiality paradigms, so when you're using encryption and you're developing protocols, it takes time, right? Developing good protocols. On top of that, if you want to make sure that your system holds certain pro properties, that things are going to remain anonymous or unlinkable or what have you, it's not trivial, right? It's not trivial to make sure that every feature addition does not break that property because properties are not things that you can so easily test sometimes. But I think this is an interesting question again to, to look at more closely. Because they're mathematical models, they're not necessarily implementation models. Sure, I agree, but, but as a company, you don't want to start implementing protocols anyway. I mean, you don't want to, what, say it again? You don't want to implement the protocols yourself anyway. I mean, the crypto protocols yourself anyway. You would take right. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's an architectural question. And, I mean, it's not because companies develop agile, there is no architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have to. Yeah, yeah. they already <laughs> said, I agree with that. Spotify and Facebook, why don't they inform the user because it's their monetary, it's their monetizing model. I mean, they make money out of yeah. putting everything on Facebook and getting more users on Spotify. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I agree. It depends on what kind of privacy. Right, like I mean, Facebook puts a lot of money into uh, the kind of privacy research I showed with respect to user expectations. Right, they have a serious problem if if I mean not serious, but like a, a problem. Um, right, they want to keep users, so we might not agree with their ultimate goals, right? But they have to constantly test to see if their privacy settings are doing what people should expect them to do, right? And it's it's a hard science. I mean, it's really really hard to do access control on social networks at that scale, right? Uh, and they're, they're doing it for, you know, on top of that, they're trying to deliver to privacy expectations of users. Um, they do uh, get every now and then a DP uh, data protection authority going after them, including the Belgian one, one must say. And there was some work uh, at, done at KU Leuven, uh, which looked at the way they were tracking people who are not Facebook users. So I think that all of these things, you know, it's very easy to say, yeah, but they have the data of 1.6 billion people, the, the game is lost. Um, or we can say, you know, let's keep SETA employed. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being cynical now. No, but um, I do think that every now and then there are pushes, and those pushes um, do allow some of these privacy technologies to come in. They might not solve the whole problem, in which case one could argue that they're just fig leaves, right? They make things softer. But WhatsApp is a Facebook company. It does have encryption in the messaging. WhatsApp does have an onion address in Tor. Uh, I mean, it's not a big win, but it is something, uh, right? It does have rather sophisticated privacy settings. Um, it does have an unreasonable privacy policy, but at least, you know, there's some things that have gone in there. I'm not saying Facebook is a good company. I'm just saying that these things make small progress around. Uh, and I think it's important not to just kind of say, Let's give up because you can say the same with security. Data leaks all the time. Why do you secure systems, right? Yeah. And this is this is really not an argument. I think as professionals, we need to do our work right. Yeah. I think um, it's time to take this discussion to drinks. Um, I hope that we'll continue there. Uh, I'm really curious to hear what you think and where I think where you think I should go with my research because this is super exciting. Thanks. <laughs>